Welcome to the 34th session of our New Testament series. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We continue to read from the first Corinthians. We just finished up on chapter nine. In chapter nine, Paul is saying he's all things to all people. What he means by that is that he's willing to adapt himself to the people who are there. So some believe that they couldn't eat certain meats. Others didn't believe that. And so Paul sees what they believe, and he works on their conscience. He knows that he's allowed to eat certain foods, but if they feel that they can't, and he's that kind of an audience, he will not eat that food so as not to give them scandal. So now we come to chapter 10. In chapter 10, Paul recalls for them what was happening when they went through the desert. As they went through the desert with Moses, he says they were washed in the baptism of Moses. Kind of a unique idea, but what he's doing there, he's connecting Christ with Moses' journey through the desert. And so they escape from the Egyptians. There's a cloud that covers them. And so they go through this cloud. They go through the waters of the Red Sea. And then they come out into the desert. And in the desert, he tells them they ate manna, spiritual food. They drank from the rock. And he's saying, this is all Christ. Christ is the rock. Christ is the one who provides for their needs. So now he goes on from there and he's saying now, therefore, whoever thinks he's standing secure should take care not to fall. So don't get too proud about the gifts that God has given you. No trial has come to you, but what is human? So he's saying, don't worry. Things that they say, the evil people, the idolaters, they reach out to these demons or other gods. But you're not going to be harmed by these other gods. He goes on to say in chapter 10, these other gods don't exist. I'm speaking of the sensible people, just for yourselves, what I am saying. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, we though many are one body, and we are all partakers of the one loaf. What he's pointing to here is the unity of Christianity. We all belong to the one body of Christ. And Paul is not going to expand on that. And as he expands on that in his first letter to the Corinthians, he's really teaching us a new kind of spiritual theology. He's introducing the idea of the body of Christ. <clears throat> and he says, look at Israel according to the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? So look back to the Israelites. Whenever they partook of what they sacrificed, they really became part of the whole celebration. They became part of a unity with Christ, a communion meal. So what I am saying, that meat sacrifice to idols, that's, it's, it's not anything. Or that an idol is anything. I don't say any of that. What they sacrifice they sacrifice to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to become participation or participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and also the cup of demons. So he's saying is some of the people, they converted to Christ, but they didn't want to give up their ways of idolatry. And Paul is saying, get rid of them. You cannot share in both cups the cup of the blood of Christ, and the cup of idolatry. You have to make a choice. So 
Are we partake of, partaking of the Lord or not? So then he goes on and says, everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. So what he's saying here is that we're allowed to eat certain foods. We're allowed to eat all kinds of food. But sometimes it's not beneficial to do what we are allowed to do. Everything is lawful, but not everything builds up. Our call in life is to build up God's creation with the help of God. And so that's what we are called to be as human beings, people who build up God's creation. No one should seek his own advantage, but that of his neighbor. What is a guide? The guide is we don't want to give scandal to a neighbor. So sometimes we say, well, I'm allowed to do that. But then we have to stop and think, does it give scandal to a neighbor? Eat anything sold in the market without raising questions on grounds of conscience. So go down to the market, pick up what you want. For the earth in its fullness belongs to the Lord. If an unbeliever invites you and you want to go and eat, whatever, eat whatever is placed before you. Don't, don't ask questions. Simply eat it. But if someone says, this is food offered to idols, so eating is sacrifice. It was sacrificed to idols. Then he's saying, in that case, it could be scandalous to purposely eat it because it's offered to idols. Then you might have to refuse. So uh, it's still a counsel. I, I mean, not only your own conscience. That's what the guide is. The guide is not only a person's own conscience, but the conscience of one's neighbor. Keep in mind, does it give scandal to someone else? Even if it's okay to do, Paul is saying, if it's fine for me to eat this, but I'm going to give scandal to a neighbor, that's a guide. A guide that tells me I shouldn't do this. So whether you eat or drink, whatever else you do, do everything for the glory of God. The glory of God comes first. As things we're allowed to eat, as he said, there's things we're allowed to do, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is helpful. So do everything for the glory of God. Let that be your guide. Avoid giving offense, whether the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in every way, he's trying to be one all things to all people. Not seeking my own benefits, he said. I don't seek my own benefits, but benefit that of the, of the many. That's what he's seeking. What benefits the many? And so Paul is saying, that is the gauge. And sometimes when we read Paul, we have to keep in mind that, that Paul is also a person of his own age. There are certain customs, kind of just part of the culture, and so sometimes they slip in as though Paul is saying, this is what God wants us to do. And in reality, he's simply repeating the way the culture treats something. The reason I say that, he next, next talks about in chapter 11, he talks about liturgical assemblies and what would happen there. So one of the things that he addresses is men and women coming to worship. And he's saying that when men come to worship, they shouldn't put anything on their heads. When women come to worship, they should wear some kind of head covering. And the reason he gives, he goes back actually to the story of Adam and Eve. He said, because you man, human beings as, as males, again, he's following his culture. This is not necessarily an insight into what God is teaching. But he's saying, well, they're created to the image and likeness of God, the man. And then he's saying the woman is meant to serve the man. She's after the man. So she has to cover her head because she's subservient in some way to the man. This, of course, would cause quite a stir today if we were to try to preach this. But to see it as something that Paul is simply saying, this is what we should do, never realizing that it's decorum for the culture. But it's not decorum for our present age. It's not a law for our present age that women who come to worship should have their head covered. And also he's saying women should not have their head shaved. 
They should have long hair, but men should not shave their heads. He's not saying that they should go around bald, but he's saying they should not have long hair. And again, part of the culture. So he's really just simply reiterating the way of thinking, the decorum of the culture in which he lives. And so now he begins to talk about the Lord's Supper. And what happens now from about this point on, we get some deep spiritual lessons from Paul. They're lessons that really have affected our way of thinking today, spiritually, how we should live, how we should view the gifts God gave us. And so one of the first things he talks about is coming to the Lord's Supper. And what he notices is that some of the people come, they bring the food with them, and they're now to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So what he's saying to them is that, first of all, I hear that when you meet as a church, there are divisions among you. So the Lord's Supper is meant to be a supper of unity. But he's saying to the Corinthians, but sometimes there's divisions among you. I'm hearing that, that at the Lord's Supper, which should be a supper of unity, there are divisions. And so he wants to correct that. But one of the divisions is the fact that some of the people bring food for themselves, but don't share it with others who don't have the food. And he's saying to them, you're sinning, and you're making the meal a means of your sin. And so he tells them, hereafter, eat and drink at home, and then come together to share in the Lord. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. And now he talks about the Eucharist, how the Eucharist is celebrated. This is a model for us. This is how we celebrate the, actually the institution narrative. And after he had given thanks, after Jesus had given thanks, he had given that, he said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Realize that when Paul speaks about the death of the Lord, He's speaking about death and resurrection. So he doesn't think it's the same human body that's on the cross. When he says until he comes, he's presuming resurrection. And so we see that when he says he's proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes, the Lord's death and resurrection. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself or herself, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. In other words, he's saying, it's not the spirit alone. Some people say, it doesn't matter what my body does. My spirit is what is mostly important. As long as I have a spirit of love for God, doesn't matter what I do. Paul's saying, no, no, it doesn't work that way. This is why many of you are ill. So Paul sees physical affliction. He's still in that Jewish mentality. In Jewish mentality, if God is displeased with you, there'll be some kind of physical ailment to show it. When Jesus heals the paralytic, he says, your sins are forgiven. The people say, Who does he think he is saying he's forgiving sins? But then that the people might know that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. He tells the paralytic, stand up and walk. The physical healing is a sign that a spiritual healing has taken place. So Paul is a little bit into that. If we discerned ourselves, we would not be under judgment. But since we are judged by the Lord, we are living, we are being disciplined 
so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So we're being disciplined by the Lord. So what he's saying is don't eat it unworthily. Be a person worthy of Eucharist. One of the ideas behind Eucharist, Jesus ate and drank with sinners. We're not perfect. And so what Paul is saying here is the fact, this is what we strive to be. He knows that we're weak. He even admits himself to be weak. But he shares in Eucharist and invites us to do the same. Because Eucharist helps us to be a better person, to fulfill our call to sharing our life with others. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, now here's where he makes a change. and Actually, it's a change that we even see reflected today. When you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that you, your meeting may not result in judgment. The other matters I shall set before you in order when they come. Actually, this might be a change in history. Looking back at the time of Paul, there was an occasion when people came together. They would listen for the scriptures. They would eat a meal. That's what the Last Supper was, a meal. And at the meal, they would then bring about the institution narrative. But Paul is noticing, no, no, the meal is becoming itself a means of sin. So he's saying, hereafter, eat and drink at home. What happens in our liturgy today, we don't eat and drink before we come to the institution narrative. It's not part of our ritual. Paul changed that. Paul took that away from the ritual and said, no, it was leading to sin. Hereafter, eat and drink at home and come together for the institution narrative and worship of God. So chapter 12, it's a way of thinking that Paul's going to introduce now, something brand new to think he's talking to a community. Now in regard to spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. I want you to know what these spiritual gifts are. You know how when you went to pagans, you were constantly attracted and led away from to, 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 to mute aisles. You were led to them. Therefore, I tell you that nobody speaks by the Spirit of God and says, Jesus be cursed. So if the Spirit of God is in you, you cannot curse God, you cannot curse Jesus. And no one can say without the gift of the Spirit, Jesus is Lord. If we believe in faith, he's saying, that Jesus is Lord, we have the Spirit. The Spirit is the one who inspires us to really believe that Jesus is Lord. And so when we can say that, we know we are speaking by the Spirit, but we cannot curse Jesus. That's not the Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. He's talking about divisions in the Corinthian church but at the same time, in the church at large, he's trying to say that God has a plan for the body of Christ. And sometimes in our human pride, we want to have all the gifts. And we become a little jealous of those who have gifts that we don't have. So he's saying there are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. So there's one God. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. The gifts of the Spirit that we receive, it's not for me or for the individual alone. It's for the community, for the family of God. And so that's what is the family of Christ. To one is given through the Spirit, the expression of wisdom. Some are very wise a gift of the Holy Spirit, spiritually wise. To another, the expression of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. So some have knowledge, spiritual knowledge, and able to share that, expression of knowledge. To another, faith by the Holy Spirit. There are some who have such a strong faith, nothing can phase that faith. 
many of us can say, Lord, I do believe, help thou my unbelief. We can quote that from the scriptures. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, mighty deeds. To another, prophecy. When they speak about prophecy in the scriptures, prophecy means to speak in the name of God. I've mentioned this before. It doesn't mean to tell the future. It means to speak in the name of God. When I share the homily on Sunday, I'm a prophet. Right now, I'm a prophet. I'm speaking in the name of God. And that's really what prophecy is. Sharing the message of God as we learn it and pass it on to others. To another, discernment of spirits. To be able to discern how the spirit is working. To another, a variety of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. So he's saying all these gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. They're given to each individual for the benefit of the community. And so sometimes we like to take these gifts to ourselves and say, what a very good, spiritual, wise person we have here. But Paul is saying, it's not your gift for you alone. Here's a story, Father McNutt. He was an ordained priest. And unfortunately, he eventually lost faith, left the priesthood. But he kept healing people. He was healing people before, healing people after. And others said to him, well, how can you keep healing? You no longer act as your ordination gave you or called you to act. And he said, read the scriptures. The gift of healing is not given because I'm holy, he said. The gift of healing is a gift from God for the community. God didn't take that gift away from me, still for the community, but for me, no. And so it happens. He's kind of saying, it's a gift, a gift given by God. And part of the understanding of that is that it keeps us from becoming proud and also keeps us from becoming jealous. That person has a gift. I wish I had that gift. If God doesn't want me to have that gift, I will not have that gift. But one and the same spirit produces all the gifts. So every bit of the gifts we have, the community has, comes from the spirit. So what Paul is saying here is that the community has these gifts, not just the individual who has it with all of them. No, no, it doesn't work that way. So distributing them, the Holy Spirit, individually to each person as the spirit wishes. So giving them to each person as the spirit wishes. As the body is one, though it has many parts and all the parts of the body, though many are one body. So also Christ. Paul is basing a lot of his theology upon the idea of what happened to him on his road to Damascus. God appears to him, Jesus appears to him as a shining light. And he doesn't say to him, so why are you persecuting Christians? What Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus identifies with all Christians. To persecute a Christian is to persecute Christ. And so that's what's being said here. Paul's saying, we're all one. And he then goes for three long years, reflects on everything. God speaks to him. And as God speaks to him, he begins to develop a theology that he passes on to us, a way of looking of saying, how does Jesus' message live in our life? And what Paul is saying is, it's not just in my individual life, it's in me as a member of the community. It's a hard concept for us to pick up in an independent world. And yet, if we look at our prayers, our Father, we don't say, my Father who art in heaven. And so the idea is we are a community. So Paul goes on. He now expounds on what he means by the body of Christ and compares it to our human body. Now, the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. No matter what we say, 
a baptized person might say, well, I left the church. You can't leave Christ. Once you're baptized, you belong to Christ. We can say it and believe it, but it doesn't happen. We cannot leave Christ. Or if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It does not, for this reason, belong any less to the body. So whatever we say, just because I say it doesn't make it. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And so he's saying, we can look at someone and say, I wish I had that gift. But that gift is given for the sake of the body of Christ here on earth. Christ, if Christ were to give us that gift, another gift, another gift, we would be almost useless. Because we have to have gifts that really touch upon the needs of the people we encounter. If the body were all eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, what would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts of each one of them in the body as God intended. When God created our body, God knew we need fingers. God knew we need a foot. God knew we needed eyes. They all have a different function. And they're all very necessary for the body. If there were only one part, where would the body be? So Paul's expounding on this. But as it is, there are many parts, but one body. I do not need you, nor again can any part of the body say, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. So he's saying there are sometimes parts of the body that seem to be weaker, sometimes even abhorrent. Paul himself, three times I begged the Lord to take this thorn from me. Whatever the thorn was, we don't know. But it's something that bothered him, and he knew that others seemed to see it. And God's answer, my grace is sufficient for you. God had decided not that Paul would have this, but God decided you can live with that. My grace is what you need. Paul shared Christ's message. He didn't have to look perfect. He didn't have to be a good-looking, handsome person. That wasn't what God needed from him. God needed him to be someone to share God's message. Whereas our more presentable parts, they don't have to be hidden. So what we have, the gifts, they should be seen by others. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to the part that is without it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. What he's talking about here again, I might look around and say, I wish I had the gift of healing. But the gift of healing, that could change my ministry. If someone's called to preach God's word, and suddenly crowds came out because they heard he's able or she's able to heal. Then what happens? The mission changes. And so Christ gives us a gift, but the gift is part of what God wants of us, our vocation, our mission. So if all parts of the body are parts of Christ. And the opposite works. If one part of the body suffers, all past suffer, all suffer with it. So if I have a headache, I don't say, well, it's okay, it's just my head that's bothering me. My whole body feels it, especially if it's a migraine. My whole body can get sick because I have a headache. And so what happens is if one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. We don't say, well, that's just my head. No, it doesn't work that way. Same thing with Christ. There are people who lose faith people who share a, a false image of the faith. In many ways, we suffer with that. We're hurt by that. And so we pray for those people because we want to also help them, but we want the body of Christ to be a reflection of the love and concern of Christ. And so basically what Paul is saying here is that we belong to a community. And at other parts, he's saying, our body doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. 
we don't make decisions and say, well, that's only part of my body. I think I'll cut off a finger. I don't need it. It keeps getting in my way. We cannot do that. It doesn't belong to us. And so we can't make those decisions. We are the body of Christ on earth. So now that we are Christ's body and individually part of it, some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles. So some are designated to be apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then those that can perform mighty deeds, gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and a variety of tongues. He's saying everybody's given a different gift. There are called, some called to be apostles. He's not talking about the 12 apostles, so those, that, that image of apostles. Those who are meant to go out and share Christ's message, that's their ministry. So St. Francis Xavier sent out to share Christ's message. So that's an apostle. So that's a calling. God calls him to that. The mother of a large family is not called to that because God doesn't want that at that time. God has another mission for her. And so the idea being each one of us has a mission. Some are prophets. Some are called to preach God's word. Others aren't. Some are called to go from place to place, preaching Christ's word. Not everybody. Some are teachers. Some teach about Christ, teach about God. But if everybody was a teacher, we would suddenly say, well, what else can they do? They're all teachers. The world would fall apart because we need plumbers. We need people to do other aspects of life. So what about healing? As I mentioned already, if I had the gift of healing, my ministry might change a great deal. I cannot touch a person who is really injured, a person whose leg is broken and heal that leg. That's not a gift that God gave me because it's a gift that's given to some perhaps for the sake of the person, that particular mission, but it's not my mission, not my vocation. And those who speak in tongues. Tongues is something kind of interesting in the scriptures. We'll talk about that a little later. But there are some who have the gift of tongues. It's kind of praising God in a, almost a garble that sounds to most people, something that's unintelligible. Paul says, I would rather that if I come into a community, I'd rather see people who are prophesying, sharing God's message, rather than speaking in tongue. A person who speaks in tongue, they experience God's loving presence. But that's for them. It's not to be shared with someone else because it's not able to be shared unless there is an interpreter there. The interpreter is the one who is able to begin to speak God's message immediately or somewhat following upon the person who gobbles, if you want to say, in this tongue. And so Paul is saying, if I have all the gifts, have a choice. The gift I at least want is the gift of tongues. Paul himself admits he has the gift of tongues. He's able to pray and experience God's presence in some way. But at the same time, he doesn't use it within the community. So some can perform these mighty deeds, some cannot. Chapter 13. So Paul's now saying, I'm going to show you a more excellent way, the way you should act. And so he speaks about something that we very often hear, something that's very poetic, something that's used at weddings. I'm sure already you know it's coming up. Now speaks about this. He said, if I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love. So he's now going to speak about love. So I say it comes up in marriage, but it's really a very challenging quote. If we really listen to it, it's really a challenge to change our life in many cases, to really be a different person. So if I do not have love, I'm simply a resounding gong or clang, I'm just making noise. And if I have the gift of prophecy, being able to understand all mysteries and all knowledge. So if I have that gift and can say, I understand everything. And if I have faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love. Love is so important. I don't just learn to get these for myself. 
I have to have love. I have to reach out. It has to be shared. So if I have love, I can move mountains. It doesn't mean anything. If I give away everything I own, and if I hand my body over so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So no matter what I do, I need love to make it worthwhile. So Paul is saying this, we need love. Now comes the part that we often hear at the weddings. Love is patient. Patience is difficult. Patience, as just about everybody could tell us, patience is one of the most difficult virtues. Love is kind. It's a challenge for us to say, how, how kind are we to others? It is not jealous. Oh, that's a tough one for many people. Love is not jealous. It's not pompous. We don't brag about all the gifts we have. We don't want to be front and center all the time. It is not inflated. It doesn't make us feel like, oh, I'm better than these other people. It's not inflated. It's not rude. I don't try to insult people. It does not seek its own interests. Love doesn't just simply say, well, I don't care about you. I want this and I'm going to get it. It might hurt you, but I'm going to get it. It is not quick tempered. That is difficult. For many people, they say, I have a short temper, short fuse, quick tempered. Love is not quick tempered. It doesn't mean we won't fail, we will. That's how weakness is involved in this also. It shows us some of the things we have to work on perhaps, or perhaps should look at and reflect upon. It does not brood over injuries. That's a difficult one. People don't realize, but very often they get hurt by so many things. He hurt me, she hurt me. She hurt me when she did this. He hurt me when I did that. We do get hurt, we get insulted. And yet at the same time, how do we bear those insults? So that's love. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. So I can be against a person and see that person really attacked by somebody else and say, oh, good, I'm glad. But we shouldn't rejoice in that. Pray for the person, the person who we say he's doing wrong or she's doing wrong. So it bears all things, that's love. It believes all things. It believes that this is God's creation. We're in the midst of God's creation. Hopes all things. Everything leads to good, everything leads to God. And really I have hope that in the difficulties of this moment, I can find God. Endures all things. It's really difficult to be insulted and endure it. And yet at the same time, God is saying, this is what love is. Love really is reaching out beyond ourselves. It's the biggest challenge actually in life. The challenge of thinking of others rather than thinking of ourselves. As I say, it's read very often at weddings. And it's probably one of the most challenging quotations in the scriptures. But it sounds nice, very poetical. It's poetical, but challenging. Love never fails. If there are prophecies, they will be brought to nothing. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, they'll be brought to nothing. He's talking about the bottom line at the end. What about these things? Love is what is there. All these other things pass away. But love does not pass away because love is within our person. For we know partially, and we prophesy partially, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So everything we say, we suddenly see it in God's eyes. And we realize these things that sounded so profound are not as profound and leading to pride as they should. But Paul's saying, when I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child, when I became a man, I put aside childish things. At present, we see indistinctly, as in a mirror. But then we see face to face. We see God as God is. 
now we don't have that view. We have kind of a, a, a cloudy view of God as best as we can as human beings. But then once we see the grandeur of God, the glory of God, we suddenly realize all these things that seem so important during life are not that important. At present, I know only partially, then I shall know fully as I am fully known. So God's going to know us. And sometimes we learn things about ourselves that we never knew. So he's saying, so faith, hope, love remain. These three. But the greatest of these is love. At the bottom line again, what's most important in life? Faith in God. Hope. We have hope for eternal glory with God. And love using God's gifts for the sake of building up God's creation and sharing eternal life with God. So Paul is speaking about all these things, all these gifts. As I say, this part of 1 Corinthians, it really puts together many of the spiritual thoughts that we live by as church today. Chapter 14. Pursue love, but strive eagerly for the spiritual gifts. Above all, he says, that you may prophesy. For no one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to human beings, but to God. And no one listens because he utters mysteries in the spirit. So, prophecy. He would rather you prophesied, shared God's message. This can be done not simply in preaching. It can be done in common, common conversation. Two people talking to each other saying, boy, God really helped me today. God was with me today. So the reality is we can do this. We can prophesy. God really blessed me with a wonderful family. On the other hand, one who prophesies does not speak to human beings, does, does speak to human beings for their building up, encouragement, and solace. So we're meant to be a person of encouragement. We're meant to be a positive person, spiritually. So... What he's saying to us is God calls us to be a positive person. And that's kind of interesting. Whoever speaks in tongues builds himself up. But whoever prophesies builds up the church. Now, I should like all of you to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. So Paul's saying, it's a great gift. I'd like you to have it because it enables you to experience a closeness to God. But I would rather you had the gift of prophecy so that you can share God's love with others. One who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets. So the one who speaks in tongues I mentioned already is usually someone there, or he himself, or she herself, who can interpret what was just said. And so unless he interprets, then that becomes a prophetic statement. Now, brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in tongues, what good will I do you? So if I come to you, I can speak in tongues. What, what good is it? Likewise, if inanimate things that produce sound, such as a flute or a harp, do not give out their tones distinctly, how will what is being played on a flute or a harp be recognized? And then he goes on to speak about the battle cry. It's a bugle. But the bugle has to give that tune, that battle cry, just going bloop, blowing into the tune and just playing bugle sound, that doesn't work. There is a tune, something that says, this is a battle cry. So it means something. So what Paul is really saying to us here is that we are called to understand God's message, live God's message, share God's message, and do it in love for others. Therefore, one who speaks in tongues should pray to be able to interpret. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit is in is at prayer in my mind, but it's not, not reproductive. He's saying that prayer should be something that is not just in the mind, but also something that can be shared if there is a community present. If a person's quietly or alone praying, gift of tongues is fine. But if a group is together and someone speaks in tongues, 
there has to be an interpreter there, either the person himself or herself or somebody else. So now Paul goes on. Brothers and sisters, stop being childish in your thinking. In respect to evil, be like infants. But in thinking, be mature. So realize that uh, and when you look at evil, be, be like a child. Stay away from it. It is written in the law. By people speaking strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. And even so, they will not listen to me. So God's going to speak to people. But what the scripture is saying is that I can speak to them. I can speak to them in language they don't understand. And they're not going to listen to me. Of course not. Thus, tongues are a sign not for those who believe, but for unbelievers. Whereas prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Prophecy is meant to deepen our faith also. The idea that someone talks in tongues or praises God in tongues, unbelievers might be impressed with this, or they might, be feel, they might feel the presence of God. But the idea behind prophecy, it helps me to understand God. So what is to be done, brothers and sisters? When you assemble, one has a psalm, another has an instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything should be done for building up. So in a community, everything should be done for building up the community. If anyone speaks in tongues, let it be two or at most three, and each in turn should have an interpreter. But if there is no interpreter, the person should keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. So the interpreter should be present. Two or three prophets should speak and the others discern. But if a revelation is given to another person sitting there, the first one should be silent. This is a prayer meeting. The idea is someone might have something to say Someone suddenly is inspired by the Spirit. We don't see that too often today. Perhaps in a Quaker meeting sometimes it seems that people can speak up. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. So the idea behind prophecy, it's meant to teach and to encourage. The spirit of prophecy is under the prophet's control since he is not the God of disorder. So it's under God's control. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So the prophetic person should bring peace into a person's heart. This is really quite a wonderful writing by Paul. It's really great direction, spiritual direction, how we should live. As in all the churches of the Holy Ones, women should keep silent in the church. Now it happens, there's a little quote here, all of a sudden there's an abruptness, it, it comes in. Apparently, the commentators believe, this was added later on. It's not from Paul. Someone apparently wanted to say this somehow, so they threw it in here. But it has nothing to do, again, it's partially cultural. So women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not allowed to speak, but should be subordinate as even the law says. But if they want to learn anything, they should ask their husbands at home how things have changed. And so that's part of the culture in which they lived. It is improper for a woman to speak in church. Did the word of God go forth from you or has it come to you alone? So apparently someone had this idea in mind and thought, well, I think I'll throw it in here, a copyist. I think I'll throw it in here because it's important it goes in somewhere, and it's not important. It's a cultural practice, a cultural idea. And so it does not really come from Paul, and it doesn't really belong in the first letter to the Corinthians as it is written. It's a different culture. So Paul continues, after that little interruption, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or a spiritual person, he should recognize that what I am writing you is a commandment of the Lord, 
Lord. So he's not just simply saying, this is just something I'm thinking about. This is a commandment. Paul has been instructed by Christ. After he went to Damascus, he was blind. What other kind of retreat to reflect on all that Christ gave him? If anyone does not acknowledge that it's a command of the Lord, Lord, he is not acknowledged. So, my brothers and sisters, strive eagerly to prophesy. And do not forbid speaking in tongues. We're not against that. But everything must be done properly and in order. So the idea behind the community, there is an order in things. They should be done according to the order of things. Chapter 15, he now speaks about resurrection. So the gospel teaching. I'm reminding you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you indeed received and which you also stand, which you now live. Through it, you are being saved if you hold fast to these words. I hand it on to you as of first importance, where what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. For he was buried and was raised up on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So the idea behind it, resurrection is really important. It's not just something that Jesus said, well, I'm God, uh, when I die, I'm going to be raised, and that'll prove I'm God. No. Resurrection is Christ taking us into his life. So we know Christ is raised according to the scripture, scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, Peter, and the twelve. Then after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at once, most of whom are still living. Though some may have fallen asleep, may they died. And that he appeared to James and all the apostles. What he's saying here, there's many witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. That's why we can confidently believe that Jesus has been raised and base our faith upon it. Last of all, as to one born abnormally, he appeared to me. What he means by being born abnormally, he was called to be an apostle, not as a follower of Jesus during Jesus' lifetime, but later on after Jesus' resurrection. For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me has been ineffective. Indeed, I have toiled harder than all of them. Not I, however, but the grace of God that is with me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. The idea behind all of this, of course, is that the resurrection of Christ is really what we base our faith on. We really, as Christians, realize that we died with Christ in baptism and were raised with Christ. We share in Christ's resurrection. It's Christ's resurrection, which now affects our life. We are one with Christ. We are sharing in Christ's glory. We're sharing in the wonders of Christ's love. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is really a great spiritual theology. It gives us great spiritual insight. It's much more challenging than many of us realized. It's something that we often overlook. And yet what happens as we read this, we really begin to realize it has much of the basic ideas of living as a Christian. And so as we read Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we learn what Christ expects of us. We learn about the body of Christ. We learn Jesus' message lived as a community after Christ's resurrection and based upon Christ's resurrection. Next week, we'll continue reading from the first Corinthians. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, 
The word of Christ instructs me. The shelter of Christ protects me. The hand of Christ hold me. And the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.